limit left. Okay, wrap up, please. Okay, folks, if you have any more quizzes, bring them in. Thank you. Do you want to face up? Doesn't matter. Okay. No more quizzes out there? <clears throat> okay, that's the usual rules apply. I'll let you know when the, when the quizzes are graded and you can pick them up. It'll be sooner than you think. Okay. A little more of a down the middle quiz, right? The first problem looked like it had missing information, didn't it? You had a return on capital and you could not, for the life of you, find the reinvestment numbers. There was no capex, there was no depreciation, there was no working capital. But sometimes the information is right in front of you. You're given the free cash flow to the firm, right? What else were you given? A return on capital. So after-tax return on capital basically will give you... Remember we talked about how the difference between after-tax operating income and free cash flow to the firm is reinvestment? Hey? You were, I was looking at your answers. You guys were incredibly creative in trying to find a growth rate. I've got to give you credit for it. You had R minus G going. I don't know how you got an R and how you got a G, but you solved for the G. No, but it is going to be impossible to do it any other way other than to compute a reinvestment rate, right? The second problem, I think, was the big issue. There was actually, um, was, it's just a terminal value. And the only thing that I was checking to see was whether you were changing your reinvestment as you got to the terminal value. We played, I mean, this is a kabuki dance on every quiz, right? There's a terminal value question. Every one of them asks you, 
where, what's the reinvestment rate? So basically that's the second problem. And the third problem was mopping up. Basically it's just making sure you added the right things, subtracted the right things and ignored the right things. I don't think there was anything to ignore, but no, the add, subtract, add, subtract. If you got the, if you're saying, look, I got the sciences off on the wrong things, it doesn't work. You got to make sure you add the right things and subtract the right things. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So the quizzes will get out to you. I mean, I'm going to try to get them out as, as I said, as quickly as possible. I'll put the solutions up. Okay. But let's continue and finish off the first packet. Last session we were talking about valuing financial service companies, the dark side of valuation. Let's continue on the dark side. Okay? So let's next look at companies with intangible assets. Let's play the game. You have a company with intangible assets. The four questions remain the same. What are your cash flows? What's the value of growth? How risky are you? When will you become a mature firm? You know what makes it difficult to value companies with intangibles is the accounting is all messed up. In what sense? The earnings are really not the earnings because your biggest capex is an operating expense, R&D. And if you, ca if you expense R&D, everything gets screwed up. Your income gets screwed up, your invested capital gets screwed up, your return on capital gets screwed up. Every aspect of valuation becomes more, more difficult. So your big problem with valuing intangible assets is not that we don't know how to do it, it's the accounting is screwed up. So let's look at the basic inconsistency. The basic inconsistency that accounting faces when it values pharmaceutical companies, technology companies, is R&D gets treated as an operating expense. So we talked about what we need to do, right? We need to capitalize R&D. It's a pain in the neck. I don't like to do it, but I have to do it. Because if I don't capitalize R&D, then I'm going to get a skewed vision of the company. And it's not just R&D. It could be brand name advertising for a consumer product company. It could be recruiting expenses for a consulting company. We almost have to go back and do the basics. So I'll take you back, and this is a throwback in time. This is actually the Amgen example that we talked about. Just the, we looked at the, only the R&D part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it play out. I'm going to look at how capitalizing R&D plays out in the numbers. So there are my R&D expenses, pharmaceutical company, I'm using a 10-year life for the R&D, so I go back and collect the R&D for the last 10 years, and then I go, the, go through the dance. I write off one-tenth every year, and I keep track of how much I'm writing off, which is in the last column, 1,694 million is what's going to show up as an expense this year, and how much has still not been written off, which is almost 13.3 billion. So what I'd like you to focus on are the unadjusted numbers, is what you're going to see in the income statement, and the numbers I'm going to restate with R&D capitalized. So my un unadjusted net income is 4.2 billion, but once I capitalize R&D, that income jumps to 5.5 billion. My book value of equity is 17.9 billion if I trust the accountants, but if I capitalize R&D, it jumps to 31.1 billion. My return on equity is 23.5% is if I trust the accountants, but if I capitalize R&D, so every number shifts. So when I do my valuation with R&D capitalized, I'm going to be using very different base year numbers, very different returns in capital, attaching a very different value to growth. I might even get a very different perspective on risk. So I'm going to show you my valuation of Amgen with R&D capitalized, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Does capitalizing R&D affect the value of Amgen? That's a stupid question, because if it didn't, why would we go through this dance? But if, remember in my Excel spreadsheet, you can actually turn off the R&D. So turn it on, turn it off, you can see the effect and value. So if you have capitalized R&D, you can try this on your company. So here's what I had as my original valuation of Amgen in 2007. I capitalized R&D, I used the capitalized numbers, the numbers that I got with the R&D capitalized as my base. So base year, they were reinvesting 107% and a return on capital of 16.7%. That's the R&D capitalized return on capital. Okay. I get a growth rate of 9.6% again using my definition of reinvestment which includes R&D and my return on capital. And I make them a stable growth firm after 10 years. So cutting to the chase, if I value them with my capitalized numbers, the value per share that I got was $74 per share. Stock was trading at 55. Stock was undervalued. And if I believe my own valuation, I should buy the stock. So here's my question. If I go off, and go back to the original accounting numbers. If I hadn't capitalized R&D, 
would have got a higher value for amgen or a lower value for amgen? Don't look at the next slide because that kind of gives away the answer. Because capitalizing is going to cut both ways, right? It's going to mean I have lower earnings, but I also have lower book value, higher returns in capital. So there are going to be good things that happen and bad things that happen. Which do you think is going to win out? So if I don't capitalize r and I'm going to go back to the original accounting numbers. So income will be down, but my returns in capital will be higher. So my value of growth will be higher, right? So the net effect might cut both directions. In this case or in all cases? Okay, so I'll show you what happens in this case. In this case, all I have to do is go back. So basically, in my Excel spreadsheet, I went and said, hey, don't capitalize R&D. Go back to the original accounting numbers. My value per share dropped to 43. That's a pretty big impact from capitalizing R&D, right? But I'll give you, this is actually part of a paper I wrote in capitalizing R&D, where I took two companies. I did this for Amgen, and I did this for Merck. At the same point in time, for Merck, if I don't capitalize R&D, my value per share increases. So capitalizing R&D drops the value at Merck, it increases the value at Amgen. So tell me what's the difference. What, what, what am I, why am I getting different directions for the two companies? What sets the two companies apart? Louisa? In fact, when you capitalize R&D, what are you doing? You're bringing R&D to the level of an investment. You're asking the question, is this company earning a return on capital in its R&D that's higher than its cost of capital? You're saying, is it making good R&D investments? In the case of Amgen, what's the answer I'm finding? Yes, capitalizing R&D, in fact, increases my value because when it invests in R&D, I see an increase in earnings. Merck invested almost $120 billion in R&D in the 10 years leading into the valuation. Its earnings stayed flat. Think of what's going to happen. When I capitalize R&D, my invested capital is going to balloon out. And if your earnings are not going up, your return on capital is going to collapse. In the case of Merck, capitalizing R&D essentially told me the truth, which is this company is wasting its money on R&D. And because it's wasting its money, if it keeps doing this, its value is going to get lower. That's the whole reason for capitalizing R&D. It's to differentiate between the amp, because right now we don't have a way of, they're, they're all companies, they're all spending, we have no idea who's doing good R&D, who's doing bad R&D. This is why we capitalize R&D, or capitalize brand name advertising, because we can't just take it on trust from the R&D guy saying, hey, trust me, I'm doing good R&D. You gotta hold them to a standard, and that's effectively what the capitalizing of R&D does. So can you value in companies with intangible assets? Yes, but to do it, you've got to redo the accounting. Because without redoing the accounting, you're essentially taking the accounting numbers as a given. You're never putting the biggest capex to the test of, is this good capex or not? And that is the end result in valuation, is you want to make sure when you grow, you're actually taking good investments. So try this out in your company because many of you, and I looked at your DCFs, had capitalized R&D, which is legitimate. So if you look at a sales force, you look at uh, Apple, you capitalize R&D, just go and turn the, the on to off. It'll actually give you what the value of your company would have been with the original accounting numbers. See whether in your company R&D is increasing value or decreasing value. And maybe we can get a sense of why some companies should stop doing R&D. Because it, remember, the end result is if you're not creating value, there's nothing inherently good about R&D. R&D can destroy value, and that's effectively what we find. Your question? Uh, I was just thinking, what is the difference between the time period and the capital? You could, but in a sense, I'm giving them 10 years to, because in a, I'm bending over backwards. Because the reaction Merck would have is, I, we spend money on R&D, it takes a long time for the earnings to pay off, right? The longer I stretch it, it cuts in both directions. One is the more I stretch it, the bigger the, big, the increase in invested capital will be. So I'm giving them more time, but it'll be on a bigger base. Okay? So your earnings better go up a lot more if I give you a 20-year life instead of a 10-year life because your return on capital effect is going to, reflect, it's going to show up in both places. So I don't think extending the life of Merck is going to do much other than capturing a firm that actually used to do good R&D 25 years ago. So I'm not sure that doing that is going to help Merck very much. Any other questions? Let's talk about valuing cyclical and commodity companies. Even mature commodity companies and cyclical companies 
one of the problems you're going to face is the numbers go up and down for the company. Why? Because every time the commodity price moves, the earnings are going to move. You take Exxon Mobil, largest, most mature oil company in the world, its earnings go up and down. So let's ask the questions, and you're going to see very quickly why value commodity companies is taken over by a macro issue. And I'm not being mysterious. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? If I ask that of an oil company, if I ask that after a year when oil prices are high, your cash flows are going to be great. If I ask you when they all, after a year when the oil price will collapse, the earnings are going to be terrible. When I ask you what the value of growth is, if oil price are $120 a barrel, everything you touch turns to gold. Everything looks great. Same, same company, $40 oil prices, nothing looks good. When I ask you how risky are you, when oil price are 120 your market price is high, your debt ratio is low, your cost of capital is low, same company with a $40 oil price becomes extremely risky, especially if it has debt. When I ask you when will you be a mature company, if oil prices stay at 40, you might never make it to becoming a mature company if you're a shale oil company. But if it stays at 120, you're definitely going to make it. Every question, the answer is going to depend on a macro variable. So let's start with that obvious statement. When you value cyclical and commodity companies, that macro issue is constantly going to nag at you. So when I ask you to value an oil company, your reaction is going to be try to forecast oil prices. When I ask you to value a cyclical company, you're going to try to forecast when the next recession, the next recovery are going to be. And I'm going to make a plea that is not easy to follow. Try to keep the macro out of the micro. In other words, when you value an oil company, try not to bring your views on oil prices into the valuation. Because if you do, you create a mess. And here's why. Let's assume you think oil prices will double over the next five years. You have a great econometric model that forecasts oil prices. Let's say you build that into the valuation of Royal Dutch. What are you going to find? You don't even have to do the cash flows and the cost of capital. You know what you're going to find? Royal Dutch looks cheap. And then I'm going to ask you, why do you find Royal Dutch cheap? And the answer might be is because you think oil price will double over the next five. You're saying, so what? If you're really that good at forecasting oil prices, there's an easier way for you to make money. Just buy futures, buy options. Why use the vehicle of an oil company? So when you value a commodity company, you want to try to be commodity price neutral. And it's really, really, really difficult to do. Okay? Let me give you an example. Okay? And then actually, and I'll use a, a probabilistic technique to talk about what to do next. Because once you, you know, and I'll use Royal Dutch as my example, and I'll value it with the oil price at the time that I did the valuation. And then I'm going to admit, look, if oil prices change, this value is going to change, stating the obvious. There is a probabilistic technique I'm going to add to the process that I think is going to make my conclusions richer. Because when I value Royal Dutch, you know the one thing I feel most uncertain about? It's not the management of the company. It's not where the reserves are. It's not their cost. It's the price of oil. And if that's what I'm concerned about, even though I'm going to value the oil company at today's prices, I'm also going to concede the fact that oil prices can move. And I'm going to give you a distribution of value, which is a function of the oil price. And what am I going to do with it? You're going to see when you get that as a decision maker that your decisions can be much richer if you have a distribution rather than a single number. So let me cut to the chase and, sh and start by valuing Royal Dutch. This was in March of 2016 when the oil price had hit $40 a barrel. And that's significant because I was valuing Royal Dutch with the oil price at 40 Normally when you value companies, what do we do? We take the trailing 12-month numbers, right? And we make them our base year numbers. And I had a bit of a problem, and here's what my problem was. In the 12 months leading into March of 2016, average oil price was $55 a barrel. If I took the trailing 12-month numbers for Royal Dutch and fed them into my valuation, guess what I'm going to find? My trailing 12-month numbers are based on a $55 oil price. The oil price today is 40 I'm going to find the company to be cheap, not because it's cheap, but because I brought a point of view about oil prices through the trailing 12 months. This is a problem you always face with commodity companies. Your numbers come from a different time period where commodity prices were different. Your commodity prices move, say, so what do I do? So I'm going to jump a page to the next one to show you what I had to do. This is actually Royal Dutch revenues every year from 1989 through 2015, dollar revenues. And I've superimposed on it the average oil price every year. Do you think the two move together? 
Yeah, clearly they do. I didn't trust it, so I said, let me compute an R squared. You have all these things. That I compute an R squared, I get a 96.44% R squared. Let's say you're interested in investing in Royal Dutch. Who's the CEO of Royal Dutch? Who knows and who cares? The reality is, what the heck is he going to do? Come and watch the terminal a little closer? This is an oil price play. You're not going to assess the quality of management here. It's not going to do much. It's a pure oil price play. But embedded in this graph is something that I can use to make my Royal Dutch valuation macro neutral. I actually ran a regression of Royal Dutch revenues against the average oil price. So if you look at that regression, Basically, every $1 increase in the oil price increases my revenues by $4 billion. What's my challenge with Royal Dutch in March of 2016? The oil price had dropped to 40, but the trailing 12-month numbers reflected a $55 oil price. Can you use this regression to actually get an oil price neutral revenue? I put in a $40 oil price into the regression. I got my predicted revenues at a $40 oil price. Those predicted revenues were about $10 billion lower than the trailing 12-month revenues. Those were the revenues I based my valuation on because those are the revenues that better reflect where oil prices are today. And then I built the rest of my valuation of those much lower trailing 12-month numbers. The value per share that I got was about 39. Total valuation was a craft. You know how you learn your lessons? The hard way. You learn by losing money. And I learned about commodity companies with a very bad experience I had in 2013 when I made a mistake and bought Vale, the Brazilian mining company. I called it my 3C investment and I bought it. I actually posted on it and said, I'm betting on commodities, currencies, and country at the same time because I know prices had collapsed. Brazil was in a tailspin and the RIA was doing all kinds of strange gyrations. So I said, I'm going to buy the company. Go where it's darkest. I'm going where it's darkest. But I made, I bought the stock at like $9.50. My value was at 14. And over the next two years, the stock dropped to five. In case you're wondering, that's a wrong direction. <laughs> and finally, I got tired of holding the stock. In fact, I wrote a post on it saying, no mass, no mass. You know, the Roberto Duran, for those of you who don't follow. And then I got this blowback from, from Brazilian Portuguese saying, no, it's just something else in Portuguese. This is Spanish. You shouldn't use Spanish. I said, you're missing the point. I'm just selling the stock. I'm giving up. But as I gave up, I, the question I asked was, why did I screw up? And lots of reasons I screwed up. Brazil had more political issues that came about. But the biggest reason I screwed up was in 2013 when I valued Vale and I took the trailing 12-month numbers. I assumed that iron ore price had dropped, that those trailing 12-month numbers already reflected that low price. And that was my fatal error. Because it turned out that with Vale, it took about two years for the lower prices to flow through because they had futures and forwards and all kinds of things that they used to protect themselves. And it only in 2015 that finally they reflected 2013 prices. So guess what? My valuation was based on 2011 oil prices, not 2013 oil prices. And I screwed up. And I said, never again. When I value a commodity company, I'm never taking the trailing 12-month numbers again and take them as given because it's exactly what I'm going to dig myself into. Now, in the case of Royal Dutch, the fix was easy because the numbers moved so closely together that I could use the history to make the prediction. But the reality is, this is a conditional valuation. You know what I mean by conditional valuation? This is my value for Royal Dutch, conditional on the oil price being 40. Tomorrow we could wake up, oil prices could be 45 or 35. My value is obviously going to be different. And that's always a quandary with commodity companies is you value the company, it's a conditional valuation, so what do I do next? Remember, the one variable that I'm most uncertain about is the oil price, right? So here's what I did. I made the oil price a distribution, and this sounds more fancy than it has to be. Oil is a traded instrument. I can look at the history of oil prices. I use the history of oil prices to come up with the distribution of oil prices. That was, that was my step one. I used crystal ball, and I ran a Monte Carlo simulation. For those of you who have not used crystal ball, it's an amazing add-on to Excel. There's one cost, and I'll come back and talk about it. But when you add it on to a traditional Excel, you can take any of your DCF valuations, add crystal ball to it. I think it's free for Stern students. You can convert your valuation into a simulation. And here's what you do in a simulation. Rather than use a, a, a point estimate, $40 oil price, I put in a distribution. 
My distribution is still centered around 40, but it reflects the fact that historically oil prices have moved, and I put in the distribution. Here's what crystal ball does. It goes and picks a price out of the distribution. Think of it as physically doing that. It'll make it easier to understand. The first price it picks might be 58, much higher than today's price. I have to value Royal Dutch with a $58 oil price. To do that, what do I do? I take that regression equation I showed you. I put in the $58 oil price. I come up with revenues of $230 billion because that's what revenues would be. I value Royal Dutch with a $58 oil price. I put it back. I redo it again and again. I think the default in crystal ball is 10,000 simulations, but you can make it a million. I just do to make it a million just to see how long it takes. It takes about four minutes for it to run four million simulations. Each time, it plucks a number out. It comes up with a different value. The end result is, if you look at the very bottom, is a distribution of values for Royal Dutch. Remember, this is all to make you decide whether to invest in Royal Dutch or not. Let's say the Royal Dutch stock price is $42. My original valuation told you the stock was overvalued, right? And then I stopped there and said, that's all I can say. But here I can tell you more. The, oil pri the, the stock price is 42 I can tell you, well, it still looks overvalued. But then comparing that to 42 I, say, I can say there's a 30% chance it's undervalued, a 70% chance it's overvalued. I can go further than I could have with a single value. If you ask me what's my best case scenario, I can point to the tails of the distribution. And there is information in the tails. In fact, when you see a crystal ball simulation of value, it'll almost never be symmetric. It's only with really mature, boring, the there will be a tail. You're saying, who cares about tails? Would you rather have a tail on the right-hand side or the left-hand side? Think like an investor. Right you want to tell you, because that means you get much bigger positive outcomes. It actually could alter your decision-making. You could have two stocks which are fairly valued or close to fairly valued, trying to decide which one of them. You'd rather pick the stock that has the long positive tail because you get much larger, five times, ten times. What, remember they talk about ten baggers in value investing? The distribution will tell you if there's a chance of it. It's an incredibly useful add-on to valuation. It comes with a cost. You know what the cost is? You've got to go back and reread your statistics book. I mean, let's face it, the only distribution any of us remembers from statistics is the normal distribution. And that's a tragedy. I've seen Monte Carlo simulations run with crystal ball where everything is normally distributed because that's the only, there are 53 different choices crystal ball offers you. You look through a Bernoulli, never heard of him. Log normal, what the heck is that? And then you get to normal, say, I'm normal, it looks normal, I'll pick normal. <laughs> it's garbage in, garbage out. You can great looking output, but if you want crystal ball to work for you, you've got to invest some time in going back and thinking about different distributions. And it doesn't take a lot of time. I have a 10-page paper on my website somewhere we can download. It gives you at least a short introduction to right-skewed, left-skewed. The basics of distributions. Do you want a distribution with a center, or do you want a distribution that's uniform? It's, it tries to intuitively say, think about the variable you're trying to model, and think about the distribution that best fits it. But if you can do it, it actually makes your investing decision-making richer. Because it's no longer what's the value, what's the price. Because that's what traditional valuation does. It gives you additional information that might help you decide which stocks you actually want in your portfolio. Any questions? Okay. Yes. You know, wait, wait. When you say premium, remember futures price, spot price times storage cost. There's not no information in futures price, right? So any premium you get will really reflect the difference between the storage cost and interest rates. If it's a non-storable commodity, maybe there's information in the future. There is zero information about future oil prices in oil. It sounds almost contradictory, but oil futures don't tell you what the price of oil because it's a storable commodity. So unfortunately with oil, there's nothing I'm going to learn by looking closer at the futures price. If it were wheat, then it's different. There's a few, there is, in fact, information. But any storable commodity like oil, there's nothing you're going to learn from the futures price. Yes? Now wait, let me ask you a question. Why does intrinsic value have to be a single number? I think that's, in fact, hubris that old-time value investors, if you have an intrinsic value, it's $37.55. What I'm saying here is, at least let's be honest that intrinsic valuation comes with a distribution 
price comes with a distribution, which effectively means you'll never get a 100% guaranteed game. In fact, next thing we're going to talk about is the gap. And I'm saying the gap is not a fixed number. It's your estimate versus the market's estimate. And this just makes it clearer that when you do an intrinsic value, you're estimating intrinsic value with a range around it. So my lift valuation of 16 billion, if you ask me, am I sure about it? My answer is, are you kidding me? There's nothing I'm sure about. That comes with the distribution. The distribution is going to be immense. You know why? It's a young company. I have no idea how this business will evolve. This just makes you honestly face up to the uncertainty you have in the back. Because I think we hide from uncertainty. We act with point estimates as if we have precision where there's no precision. So I still think of it as intrinsic value. It's still built around fundamentals. It's built around the fact that fundamentals themselves can shift over time and you want to reflect that in your value. Yes? You could, the, remember though with DCFs, you don't want to over finesse your inputs. The problem with the unit results is if I go down there, I've got to go the distance, which remember that the amount, number of barrels of oil I will produce will actually be a function of the oil price. There's an optionality. So I don't even want to open that door because I don't know how many barrels of oil will be produced because that's going to be a function of whether the oil price is 30 or 100. So I'd rather just throw up my hands and say, look, there is uncertainty. But if I want to bring in additional layers into the simulation, you can. In fact, crystal ball actually allows you to bring in discrete risks. If you're worried about nationalization risk, you can bring it in. So try it out. If nothing else, add it on to your Excel spreadsheet. Because just an add-on will be a menu item. And the menu add-on becomes magical. Your inputs that used to be fixed numbers can now become distributions. So yeah. You'd get pretty, you can get the median. When you do a distribution, you can either go with the distributional numbers, play money ball, the median. In fact, when I do distributions, the median becomes my equivalent of my expected value, right? The ranges give me where, I actually, when I think about, so if you think about margin of safety, we're going to talk about it. It's embedded in the distribution. You want something to be 20% undervalued. You want to get to the 30th percentile of the distribution. So embedded in those percentiles are all of the decision-making tools you want, because the price is what you're comparing this distribution to. And the price kind of moves around, and you have to decide both your entry point and your exit point based on the distribution. So now we're going to switch hats. We've spent, what, 16, se is this session 16? I think it is, on intrinsic value. It's time to put our pricing hat on. So we're going to start the pricing game. And to understand the pricing aim, let's go back and revisit basics. Up till now, whenever we've talked about value, we know what drives value. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. We dance around it. We came up with different ways of coming up with it. But the value is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. Discounted cash flow evaluation is the tool that we used to bring those into value. Price, as I said in the very first session, is driven by demand and supply. The forces that move prices might be fundamentals in a perfect world where everybody is rational, that might be true. But it could be mood, it could be momentum, it could be behavioral. In fact, all of behavioral finance, which is a very big area in finance now, is about explaining why prices can drift away from value and stay drifted away for extended periods. The tools for pricing are very different than the tools for, for, discount, for valuation. In pricing, I need tools that gauge mood and momentum. I know technical analysis and charting is viewed almost as a dirty word in finance. You don't do that. You know, unsophisticated people look at charts and they look at head and shoulders and resistance lines. You know what? If your job is pricing, I can see entirely why you look at charts because done right, what charts and technical in indicators try to give you is a way of gauging shifts in mood and momentum. So with that set up, let's talk about pricing. My wife grew up in California, so when we got married, she didn't think this was part of the deal, that we'd move to the East Coast. So we landed up here, and she hated it from day one. I hated it from day two, but now I could live with, you know, for one day I was okay. But every winter, the hate would peak. And so for 30 years, we talked about it, but no, we really didn't do it. So about three years ago, we had a blizzard, a really bad one. You remember the ones with the slushies, heavy snow? So the nice thing about most of you living in the city is slushy, heavy snow is just slushy, heavy snow. 
you live in the suburbs, slushy, heavy snow, you look out, means shovels. So basically, three hours of shoveling, exhausting. I come back in, I throw the shovel into the side of the garage. I'm just completely done. I walk into the house and say, hon, we've got to get out of here. She must have been waiting for these words for 30 years. Because I hadn't even finished saying it. Next thing you know, she's on the computer checking out houses in California. I don't know how this happened, but she picked the most expensive part of the most expensive state in the country, La Jolla. This must have been a hovel in La Jolla, a hut, because there are only six numbers in the price. That's kind of a rule in La Jolla. If there are less than seven numbers, something must be terribly wrong. Let me ask you a question. This nice lady, Lisa Padilla, has put a 995,000. That sounds awfully precise. How do you think she came up with this number? Did she do a discounted cash flow valuation of the house? I don't think so. What did she do? She looked at other houses in the neighborhood, recent transactions, adjusted for the fact that it was one less bedroom in a smaller backyard, and she slapped a price on it. Real estate is all pricing. From that level all the way to the very top, real estate developers, it's a pricing game. No real estate developer sits there with a full-fledged DCF. It looks like a DCF, but it's a fraud because the biggest number is that price in your tent that they think they can sell the, the real estate to somebody else. It's a pricing game. You're saying those unsophisticated realtors. Okay, let's up the ante. Let's pick up a sell-side equity research report. What do you see? You see the name of a stock. You see a multiple. Price earnings, EV to EBITDA, price to book. You see 15 companies that the analyst claims are exactly like your company. And then he tells you a story. This stock looks cheap. It's trading at eight times earnings. And these 15 companies that are just like it trade at 12 times earnings. Who do you think is on more solid ground? The realtor who claims to have found six houses in the neighborhood just like yours. Or an equity research analyst who claims to have found 15 companies just like Microsoft somewhere in the universe. Sell-side equity research is just sloppy pricing. And that's what I'm going to focus on. If we're going to do pricing, let's do it right. Let's stop by comparing to the average of the 15 companies that you claim are your peer group. So when we talk about pricing, we're talking about something very different than valuation. So let's review. When you do valuation, the four questions you need answered are what are your cash flows from existing assets? What's the value of growth? How risky are you as a company? And when will you be a mature company? For 16 sessions, we've danced that dance. The forces that drive value. Are, so nothing in behavioral finance changes these forces. But if you look at what drives pricing, the game changes. It could be fundamentals, but here are the other things that drive prices. The first could be mood and momentum. In fact, one of the most fun studies I've ever read looked at um, what happens to markets in soccer-crazy countries after the country's soccer team loses a big game, like the World Cup or the Euro, or whatever cup you. So Brazil loses in the World Cup. Nothing's happened to cash flows, growth, and risk, right? So nothing should happen to value. This study found that the day after the big loss, stock prices dropped 2 to 3%. What happened? People came in in a horrible mood. So I hate everything. Sell, sell, sell. No, nothing looks good to me. You're saying, that makes no sense. It doesn't have to. It's pricing. Mood and momentum is a huge force in pricing. If the mood is good and the momentum is good, you can ride that for extended period. But if the mood and momentum shifts, all of a sudden, everything changes. The second is liquidity. Pricing is a liquidity game. You've got to be able to get in and get out. In value, we never even talked about in liquid versus liquid because, in a sense, we're willing to wait. You buy and you can hold. But when you're playing the pricing game, you can't buy and hold. You've got to buy and sell in 15 minutes. So liquidity becomes a factor much more critical in pricing. The third is what I call incremental information. These are small pieces of news. You look at it and say, that caused the price to move 15%. I still remember watching Apple stock price or the market cap drop 15 billion. One more. What happened? And it turned out that there was a tweet from some guy claiming to be in Shanghai. We have no idea whether he was actually in Shanghai. Right outside the Apple store, here's what he tweeted. This was right around a new iPhone coming out. He said, new iPhone being released today. There's nobody in the Shanghai store. This tweet flies around the world. We have no idea whether he was in Shanghai watching the store, whether any of this is true. Next thing you know, 15 billion market cap disappears. 
You're saying, that makes no sense. Small pieces of news. And that's why with an earnings report, you can see something tiny, incremental, cause huge changes in the price. And finally, with prices, you know the old Keynesian saying about what the price of something is? It's not what you or I think something is worth. It's like a beauty contest, he said, where your job is to not gauge who the most attractive person on the stage. I'm trying to be as non-sexist as I can. It's what the other judges think about the contestant of the stage, that your job is to guess who the other judges think. So that's what pricing becomes. You're not looking at the stock, you're looking at everybody. Else. Is he buying? Is he optimistic? Because if he is, then I'm buying too. Pricing is a very different game than value. But whatever the game is, when you look at the value game and the pricing game, the value game gives you a value, the pricing game gives you a price. There are three different ways to think about how those numbers play out. If you're a true believer in efficient markets, your view is those games might be different, but they deliver roughly the same number. And when they're different, price and value are different, it's for random reasons. You can't figure out why. So that's the efficient market person. Then you have the person who hangs out in Omaha. I call these the value extremists, who believe that they are the righteous ones. They've estimated the value, and it's a market that's at fault for coming up with a different price, and the price will move towards the value. It's almost an article, article of belief. And third, third, there are the pricing extremists. There's this value thing. Who cares? Okay. There's no such thing as value. You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price. Tomorrow, I'm supposed to be on CNBC at 5 o'clock after the market closes with these five traders. You've seen them all. I actually love being on the show because they have no pretense. They tell me to my face, this value thing is a waste of time. You know, I even talk about value. We know what drives prices. You know, basically, you buy at a low price, sell it. And actually, I have more respect for that than a portfolio manager who claims to be a value investor. But then you look at his portfolio or her portfolio. What do you see? The 10 biggest momentum stocks in the market. So how the heck did that happen? If you're going to play the value game, come and play the value game. If you play the pricing game, don't be delusional. Play the pricing game. So when we talk about the gap, how you think about the gap reflects your investment philosophy. Every investment philosophy out there, is you can actually frame in terms of what they think about the gap. So let's say you, uh, so I divide the world into investors and traders. Investors play the value game, traders play the pricing game. And there's nothing that makes one group nobler than the other. If you can make a million dollars playing charts or technical analysis, that million dollars buys exactly the same thing as my doing a DCF and ending up with the same million dollars. It's hubris on my part to say, my money was better earned because I did a discounted cash flow valuation. I had a long time horizon. But you know how markets start them, right? We don't call traders traders. We call them speculators and investors. And because traders are called speculators, everybody claims to be an investor. But the reality is some of us claim to come, came to play the investing game. Some of us came to play the trading game. Let's say you came to play the investing game. Okay? Let's, uh, no, let's say you came to play the tri trading game. Here are your dilemmas. Here are your weakest legs. When you play the pure tri trading game, because you have no anchor, it's based on what everybody else thinks, you're going to be whipsawed. One day you're for a stock, the next day you're against. Your strategy, by definition, is going to be reactive because you're reacting to whatever crowds do. And finally, you're trusting crowds, and crowds we know are fickle. If you've never read the book, read The Madness of Crowds. It's like a 150-year-old book about crazy investors in, in, the, in the London stock markets in the 1800s. And as you read about it, you say, nothing much has changed. They might have used a pub to spread rumors. Now we use CNBC to do the same thing. But the reality is it's amazing how similar investors are across the ages. But if you're a valuer, and I think of myself as an investor first, I face my own dilemmas. The first is when I tell you there's a gap between the stock and the value because I've assessed value, I'm not sure that there is really a gap. I could have screwed up on the value. So I thought something was cheap, but I might have screwed up on the value. So first I'm uncertain about whether a gap really exists. I think it does based on my valuation, but I'm never sure. And second, I'm uncertain, even if there's a gap, whether it will close. I don't believe in this righteous view of if there is a gap, it has to close. Why? I mean, remember the old saying, the market can stay rational longer than you can stay solvent. 
I mean, you can go 50 years in the gap. There is nothing in the equity markets that requires closure. Different with fixed income, where there's a finite maturity and there's a day in which no mispricing has to disappear. So as, a value, as an investor, my concerns are both, did I get the, value, the gap right? And second, how do I know the gap will even close? So if you think about what we try to do to make ourselves less uncertain, one is what many value investors use as their defense mechanism. Seth Klarman wrote a book that is so difficult to get now. You've got to pay like 2500 or three. It's out of print. And if you want it, you've got to pay. He's an old-time value investor, and his book is called The Margin of Safety. Somebody want to describe to me what the margin of safety is? What does it do? It's very simple. What, 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 how does it play? You basically invest in a company only if the price is more than X percent below the value. So margin of safety says, I want a 25% margin of safety. And value investors seem to think that just increasing that number makes you a better investor. And here's the problem with margin of safety. First, it's a fixed number for every stock. I demand the same margin of safety for Lyft as I do for Apple, which makes no sense. Second, what if using your margin of safety you find nothing to invest in? Then what the heck are you doing with a margin of safety? You created a constraint in the process when nothing looks cheap. So the first is margin of safety. Second is people try to collect more information. They think collecting more information is going to make the gap more certain. Trust me, it does. It just makes things more confusing. The third is you ask what if questions. We all do, right? So what if this, what if that? Again, at the end of the process, you're not going to feel any better about the gap than you did. And finally, as I said, you can face up to uncertainty. One of the reasons I do simulations is it makes me feel more comfortable about the gap and how uncertain about it. It's a strange way. Knowing how uncertain you are frees you in terms of looking at the gap and saying, you know what, I could be wrong, but this is a game of odds and the odds are in my favor. And finally, in terms of closing the gap, there are two views you can take. One is you buy something that's cheap and you take the karmic view. I've done what I can. I'm done with my valuation. The market is like God. It will deliver what it will. And it might happen, it might not. It actually is the healthiest way to think about investing. You've done your homework. You value the company. The price is a different number. You can't will the price to the value. So what the heck are you doing trying? The second is maybe you can provide a catalyst that causes the price to move to the value. Now do you see the advantage that a Carl Icahn has over you and I? When he buys something that's cheap, what's the first thing he does? He offers to come on CNBC, and of course, love to have him on. And what does he mention? He mentions how much he now loves the stock. I have a few stocks I'm going to list tomorrow. But it's not going to work for me. Because a Carl Icahn can bring a lot of people into the stock and actually cause the price to move to the value. It's what activist investors can bring to the game that passive investors cannot. I actually use a very simple device. I look for catalysts that are in my control. I like to buy undervalued companies with very old CEOs. It's a morbid thought. But when CEOs die, there seems to be a reassessment of companies. Don't ask me why. So you, know, you might want to look at the age of the CEO, something that will cause a reassessment of the company, something that will lead to reassessment. But do that. One final point, and then I'll... I said I'm an investor, and um, I've been tracking Apple for a long time. And over the last 10 years, I bought Apple multiple times and sold Apple multiple times. So you see the, you know, each of my valuations, September 11 through September two, uh, 2011 through 2018. So basically, the first time I valued Apple, it was undervalued. I bought it. So the second time I valued it. So basically, you could see the game play out. Has my value changed over time? Absolutely. But the price has changed even more. And the essence of investing is you're trying to take advantage of market mispricing in both directions. And it doesn't mean buying and holding. It means revisiting evaluation at regular intervals. So next session, we will start on packet two. Please bring packet two with you on Wednesday, because we will start on it. Without that connection, just the ball will not work, right? You get the oil price. 
somehow you got to connect something in your numbers to the oil prices. The operating income, it could be revenues, it could even be cash flow. It might be messier than it's worth, but you can try for the oil side at least. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, it's yeah, it'd be interesting. So basically, they have a history. And uh, what percentage is oil company, what percentage is chemical? Who are you doing? Occidental. Well, most of it has been oil historically, so especially if you go back in time. So my guess is you're going to learn something about how much their revenues are sensitive to oil. It might not be an R squared of 96% because there are other businesses, but that's your starting point. Somehow you can connect your revenue to oil price because you need one strong link. With one strong link, you can build the entire valuation. And then the rest of your numbers then have to be based on revenue, right? Your margin, then your percent of revenues, you reinvest. So, you know, so as long as you link up, so you've got to create the link so that when you change the oil price, it flows through into a value. That makes sense. You could even make your cost of capital a function of the oil price, which you can hear because it's a distribution. You can say the oil price is 100, my cost of capital is 20. So you put in a, a range on the cost of capital, you can tie it to the oil price. So in a sense, you can let it play out and see how it plays out in the value. Okay. Now, I have a couple other questions. I don't yep. want to hold too far, so I may switch to you. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always in capital. Acquisitions are always close to capital. No, look at my expected reinvestment rate. It's not 108%. The reason it's not 108% is that if we take the acquisition...